independent of specific interests. I would like then to start the debate. The first speaker is Manfred Weber on behalf of the European People's Party. Mr. President, dear colleagues, um, last week officially we received a letter and it took nine months to write a letter of six pages. So finally I have to say we received now the letter. Today it's the day of the European Parliament. So the signal of today is that we are ready, we can start, and hopefully after the vote we can say we are united, we stay together in these uh, negotiations. I thank first of all Guy Verhofstadt for his work to prepare our resolution and the message is clear on the procedure. First divorce, then second future treaty, then we underline what should be the atmosphere in the negotiations. We want to have a fair, constructive atmosphere. We uh, build on trust. Then we have uh, defined our priorities about citizenship. Don't play with the legal uncertainty of citizens. We are underlining that the Northern Ireland question is for us a decisive one. Avoid a hard border in Ireland. And then we have to talk about money. So the top priorities are defined. And then finally, we hope that London is respecting that uh, the EU27 will continue. So the Rome Declaration is clear, and we have to talk about our future in our union. The uh, point is, uh, from our point of view, decisive, dear friends, uh, dear ladies and gentlemen. It's a very fundamental question, and that is, what means leave? What means to leave the European Union? For example, about the security question. I hear yesterday, last week that uh, Theresa May said that they want to stay in Europol. So, dear friends, Europol is obviously a European agency. It's the European Union who is organizing Europol. They want to stay. So, means leave no access anymore to Europol, to Schengen Information System, or means leave to stay. Then we talk about the research union. Cambridge, Edinburgh, Paris, Milan are working strongly together. Does this mean with leave that there is no cooperation anymore because that is Europe at the moment, that is the European Union financing this. And then single market, trade is positive. Does leave mean no access anymore to the single market? Does leave mean no cooperation anymore? I fear London thinks that um, we find a perfect deal and that means we take the positive points and we leave the negative points. And I have to clarify this will not happen. Cherry picking will not happen. A state outside of the European Union cannot have the same or better conditions than a state inside of this European Union, dear friends. Liebe Kolleginnen und Kollegen, colleagues, what is it that we're doing here right now? Take Northern Ireland. Many Colleagues from Belfast are now coming to us with concerns about the peace process being under pressure. Or Gibraltar, I mean, you can laugh about the possibility of armed conflict, but in fact, the Prime Minister of a big country, the United Kingdom, uh, has uh, had to make clear that there are no uh, military activity, that it is not about military activities. Then there's digitalization, security issues. These are the things we should be discussing, not last century's debates. Colleagues, this demonstrates that we've taken this debate in the wrong direction, led by the nationalists and populists. Let me say to the uh, let me say to the people of Spain and Ireland, you won't be able to deal with London alone. You will have the benefit of the EU27 being together as a big family. Irish interests are not just Irish interests, they're also European interests, and Spanish interests are also European interests. 
and finally withdrawal from the European Union. Theresa May said it's not withdrawing from Europe. Well, indeed, the uh, people are going to stay in Europe, but the European Union is an idea. When the European Union's foreign ministers uh, discuss uh, Ukraine, discuss Syria, the United Kingdom will be excluded. The United Kingdom is walking out of all of these international discussions. Colleagues, we are going to remain partners and friends, but the United Kingdom has to accept the fact that there will be a tough negotiating position on the European Union side. Thank you. On behalf of the Socialist and Democrat group, Mr. Patella. Anche il pensiero. Yes, I must say that the thoughts of the Socialists and Democrats group go out to the victims of the chemical attack in Syria. We feel sorry for the victims. Twenty children or more have been killed. That's an absolute scandal. It's a scandal uh, and uh, uh, shame upon all of the political uh, decision makers. In it, we, give, we get the impression that the Syrian regime is give, being given a, a carte blanche to do whatever they like. When we're faced with a real war, you see how irresponsible certain politicians have been. There's nothing to laugh about. Two days ago, as Mr. Weber said, a former uh, uh, leader of the Conservative Party raised the spectre of a war between uh, Britain and Spain. These are the words of lost dilettants just uh, clutching at straws. The Tories wanted the referendum and the day after the vote they didn't have the faintest idea about uh, the procedure for uh, starting the divorce proceedings. Now you wanted to take back control, but what did you want to take back control of? You were promising people a better future, but your lies have simply caused absolute chaos in the UK. Well, let's not lie about it. This institution is the first to respond. And I would like to thank Mr. Verhofstadt because uh, uh, he's put in a lot of work on this resolution and we will not give our consent if the conditions set by the resolution are not respected. We want to have respect for the uh, rights of European citizens that are now threatened by Brexit. We have to s speak truth. A country outside the European Union cannot benefit from the same conditions as members do. We have to talk about the conditions for the divorce. Only when we've made substantial progress can we discuss our future relationship. And we will send straight back to sender any kind of threat or ultimatum if the UK wants to use our common security as a negotiating chip. The uh, future relationship with the uh, EU will be dependent upon the uh, respect for the social, environmental and other standards of the European Union. We cannot see the UK becoming some kind of maxi tax haven. We don't want to see any favourable treatment being given to the city. We cannot see steps backwards for workers' rights. And we have to defend the peace progress, uh, process in Northern Ireland. This is something we should be worried about. The uh, peace process is more uh, fragile than ever, and we have to be careful. It's like any family that if you uh, leave the house, you still have to pay the bills for uh, electricity, gas, etc. It's not uh, treating you anyone badly, it's simply doing your duties. 
the Brexit shows us that uh, the EU cannot simply be the sum of uh, national interests or just a single market. Rather, we are a community of values where we express solidarity. So Brexit could be a chance for us to uh, build our unity around a common destiny. Thank you very much. Data la delicatezza del dibattito, non concederò. Given the highly sensitive nature of this debate, I will not be allowing blue cards during this morning's debate. I have an extremely long list of speakers. Every group is allowed to set out its own position for or against Brexit. But I will refuse to allow this debate to transform this chamber into a football stadium with people hurling, shouting at each other. Come sono sempre stato. As has always been the case. When I'm presiding the debate in the chamber, I'm always flexible about speaking time for group leaders. I will treat all group leaders in exactly the same way. Whenever presiding sessions in this House, I've always done so with a sense of fairness. Today, I would call on all members to debate Brexit in a serene way, focusing on concept. And I will not accept any members shouting or raising their voice. Every political group will be entitled to speak on several occasions. The Conference of Presidents of the European Parliament decided that at the end of the debate we would give group leaders the opportunity to speak a second time. In other words, we'll be having a comprehensive debate and everybody will have ample opportunity to set out their position. The next speaker are on behalf of the European Conservatives and Reformist, Ms. Stevens. Dear President, dear colleagues, today I hope begins the process of shaping a better future for the peoples of Europe. The peoples whose jobs, businesses, economy and security all depend on us to take the EU in the right direction, a new direction. The UK leaving mustn't be a missed opportunity to create positive change. That is why the ECR group adopted last week its vision of a reformed and decentralized European Union. I can recommend it to you. Britain is an island, not a boat. It will remain where it is. It will remain one of our most important economic, political and security partners. The United Kingdom and the European Union are friends, not enemies. This should not be a nasty breakup, but the beginning of a deep and special partnership between long-standing allies. We need to start work on a comprehensive deal right now, a deal that looks at everything, cooperation on security, trade, education, research, transport, and yes, money. Everything from the start, there's no time to lose. If we do anything less, history will judge us harshly as having been small and petty when the challenges of our age required us to be bold and visionary. Mr. Verhofstadt, you spent a great deal of time in your campaign for President of the Parliament distancing yourself from the backroom deals of the past. Yet, once again, the pleas for openness and transparency feel like the same old empty promises. Promises which those outside of Brussels are increasingly frustrated with. The negotiation and process of this resolution have sought to exclude the opinions of some political groups and members in this Parliament. When you do that, you do not just exclude the voices of those members, but also the voices of their electorates. Mr. Verhofstadt, no one is asking you to agree with everyone, but you could at least listen to what they have to say. That is not to say we don't agree with anything in the joint motion. We do. We agree, for example, that it is essential that the rights of EU citizens in the UK and of UK citizens in the EU are dealt with quickly and fairly. But we do not share other key points. We believe the European Parliament should seek to support the EU negotiator, not make life more difficult by making excessive demands in advance. 
That just looks like the same old tired tactics which undermine the credibility of this chamber. The three-year limit on transitional arrangements seems arbitrary. We might want different lengths for different issues. And we deeply regret that all the work prepared by the Parliament's committees was just brushed aside. Mr. President, fellow members, my hope is that the EU will emerge from Brexit renewed and able to prevent the departure of other member states. The next two years should be about building faith of the peoples of Europe in the decisions we are making. If the EU is to come back stronger and if we really want to win back the confidence lost by our citizens, then this is not only the moment to determine how we will work with the UK in the future, but also how we can get the EU back on track. I call on all colleagues to listen to the recent statements by several European leaders who show that there are alternatives to ever more Europe. We need to follow the path to a decentralized confederal Europe. There simply is no support for more centralizing Eurofederalism. With or without Britain, we need a new direction for Europe. Thank you. On behalf of the Alliance for Liberal Democrats in Europe, the next speaker is Mr. Verhofstadt. I, tell, I have the feeling that it was a very sad moment uh, Wednesday last week uh, when the British uh, ambassador uh, gave his letter to, um, to President Tusk. That was my feeling in any way. Uh, a very sad moment. And it's true, naturally, that the relationship between Britain and, and Europe was uh, never an easy uh, relationship. Let's recognize that. It was never a love affair and certainly not a question of wild passion uh, between. It was more, I think, a, a little bit a marriage of convenience, uh, if I can uh, use that uh, word. And that was already clear, uh, dear colleagues, from the beginning. From the beginning, in the 50s, uh, Britain decided against the membership of the coal and steel community. Uh, Attlee and Labour didn't want it. And it was Churchill and the Tories who were in favour. It's good to recall this. And in 55, during the start of the common market, well, yeah, Britain walked away from the table where we negotiated that. And in the early years of the Union, uh, it was uh, the British Prime Minister, Macmillan, uh, who looked at the continent with uh, nothing less than uh, suspicion. What were they cooking up there in Brussels? Were they really discussing coal and steel and customs union? Or were they also talking politics uh, in Brussels? Plotting on foreign policy? Oh, God forbid, defense matters even. So the British Prime Minister wrote to his, uh, Macmillan, to his foreign minister, and I quote him, I have here the quote, for the first time since Napoleon, the major continental powers are united in a positive economic grouping with considerable political aspects. And to his own surprise, Macmillan has to admit this new experiment, and I quote further, was not directed against Britain. <laughs> so when Britain finally joined the European Union in, in 1973, after, as we all know, several blockades by General de Gaulle, the headlines were festive. You have to read even the, the whole press in Britain in 1973, it was a great day for Britain to join the European Union. But let's be honest about this, it was only a short honeymoon, as we know, because Margaret Thatcher asked her money back, and uh, the successor, her successor, John Major, called the euro, and I quote again, a currency as strange as a rain dance, with the same impotence. Well, I have to tell you that the pound slipping against the euro as we see today was not exactly what Major expected uh, at that moment. But the rest, all the rest, let's be honest to each other, is history. Perhaps let's recognize it between us. It was impossible maybe to unite Great Britain with the continent, a naive maybe to reconcile the legal system of Napoleon with the common law of the British Empire, and perhaps it was never meant to be. But... And that's important, and I hope the EU plot is also. <laughs> Our predecessors should never be blamed for having tried to. Never, I think, because it's important 
in politics as it is in life, to try new partnership, new horizons, to reach out to the other at the other side of the channel. As I am also convinced and 100% sure about one thing, that there will be one day or another, dear colleagues, that there will be a young man or a young woman who will try again. Who will lead Britain again into the European family once again. And a young generation... A young generation that will see Brexit for what it really is. A catfight in the Conservative Party that got out of hand. A loss of time, a waste of energy, and I think a stupidity. Although I continue, dear colleagues, although I continue to think that Brexit is a sad and, and regrettable event, I believe also it's important that we remember something. Remember what Britain and Europe in these more than 40 years have achieved together. It's true we may not have got the most passionate relationship, but it wasn't a failure either. Not for Europe, and certainly not for Britain and the British. Let's not forget, Britain entered the Union as the sick man of Europe, and thanks to the single market came out the other side. Europe made Britain also punch about its weight in terms of geopolitics, as in the high day of the British Empire. And we from our side must be tribute also to Britain, to Britain's immense contributions, a staunch, unmatched defender of free markets and civil liberties. And thank you for that, because as a liberal, I'll tell you, I will miss that in the future. <laughs> Colleagues, within a few weeks, we will start um, the process of separation. And I think, um, Mr. Juncker and Mr. Barnier, the goal must be to have a new and stable relationship and a deep and comprehensive partnership and association between the UK and the EU that certainly will be very different, as we all know, from membership. And let's, in this new venture, always remember one thing. Our common bounds, our common culture, our common and shared values, our joint heritage, our history. And let's never forget that together we belong, in fact, to the same great European civilization. From the Atlantic port of Bristol, I go even towards the banks of the mighty river, uh, the Volga. But it's maybe a little bit too far for the moment. <laughs> but let's be honest, and that will be my final point, Mr. President. Brexit is not only about Brexit. Brexit has to be, dear colleagues, also about our capacity to give rebirth to our European project. Because let's recognize, Brexit didn't happen by accident. And even when since Brexit, we see, I call it, a change for the good in the mood of the public, let's not fool ourselves. Europe is not yet rescued. And Europe is not yet recovered from the crisis. Europe is still in need of change, I think in need of radical change, change towards a real union, an effective union, based on values and based on the real interest of our citizens. And a union also, and I want to conclude with that, that stands up against autocrats. Autocrats who close down their universities, to give one example. Autocrats Autocrats who throw journalists in jail, as is happening today. Autocrats who make from corruption their trademark and who yesterday, as we all have seen, beyond any humanity, bombed again innocent women and children with chemical weapons in Syria, to give the most nasty example. <laughs> so, I think, uh, Mr. President and dear colleagues, let's end these negotiations. We'll have to start now in the coming weeks. Never forget why our founding fathers, British and other Europeans alike, launched this European project. And there are three words. That is freedom, that is justice, and that is peace. And I think it's three great things where it is worth to fight for. Thank you very much, colleagues. Per il gruppo confederale della sinistra for the GUI group, the floor goes to Mrs. Zimmer.
Vielen Dank, Herr Präsident. Thank you, President. Just over nine months ago, the referendum took place in the UK. Article 50 was triggered last week. At that time, it really sunk home that the separation between the UK and the European Union was, really was to take place. The time of weapons drawn on both sides or irresponsible demagogues such as Mr. Farage and others spouting on has come to an end. That is clearly over. The time has come for us to deal with each other in a measured, respectful and fair way so as to enable us to reach an agreement which will enable the United Kingdom and the European Union to coexist together. This separation process is making it abundantly clear just how deep and extensive ties are between all the member states. It covers all areas of life. This demonstrates how the 15 months left is an incredibly short time to negotiate this. This makes it necessary for the European Parliament, not just today or indeed just at the end when we sign the Act of Divorce, also throughout the whole process the European Parliament has to be actively involved. We have to give our agreement. When the second phase is triggered off, we, the European Parliament, must also be consulted. What are the important factors for us? We believe that, above all, the rights of people, the rights of the citizens of the European Union, of all 28 member states, must be given absolute priority. We believe it is important that UK citizens who reside in the UK and vice versa more than 5 million, plus the 1.8 million people who live uh, outside, we believe their rights should be guaranteed. And we all know very well that we're not just talking about people who are directly affected. We know that this has enormous implications for peaceful coexistence in important regions in the European Union. We specifically welcome that the proposal refers to the Good Friday Agreement concerning peace in Northern Ireland and it views the situation in Northern Ireland in a comprehensive way. From the very outset the European Union was both actively involved in negotiations leading to the Good Friday Agreement and a guarantor thereof. For this reason alone we are duty bound to ensure that the interests of all people on the island of Ireland must be to the fore of our minds. Here and now in the 21st century we cannot allow a new hard border to emerge in the European Union. I never want to see borders in my own country. I never want to see walls and fences going up. What else is important for us? We believe in fundamental rights, in social rights. We believe in all the foundation stones of human dignity, we want to ensure that all those values figure highly in the negotiations. Let me make it clear, the way in which we conduct these negotiations will have a decisive impact on the future of the European Union. We must also ask ourselves how it has been possible for demagogues such as Mr Farage to turn the tables to turn public thinking in the UK. The source for Brexit wasn't just domestic problems or catfighting in the Tory party. Another reason was unsolved problems in the European Union. What has happened to the social union? What has happened to social protection, employment protection, the social pillar? What's happened to our promises for more and greater democracy? That's the signal we have to send out to our people. Let us take up arms together. This is the only way that at the end of this process we can come out with a good agreement to the benefit of all people and citizens of the European Union and I include immigrants and migrants when I say that. Thank you. For the Green Group and the European Free Alliance, Mr. Lam Mr. Lambert. Prime Minister May. You inherited a situation you did not create, yet you had a choice. 
and by choosing for the hardest form of Brexit, you chose the most extreme interpretation of the referendum. Doing so, you encouraged all those on the continent as well as up to the from the uh, sorry on the continent as well as in the UK from the fringes of the political landscape up to the benches of your own government who have made grandstanding and threatening their brand of politics. On the one hand, we have those who call for making Britain the world champion of social and tax dumping, or even of starting a war with Spain. On the other hand, we have those who say we should punish the United Kingdom. Have the last 70 years not told them anything. But Mrs. May, by your own choice, you dug yourself a hole of contradictions. How can you have a hard Brexit without having a hard border in Ireland? How can you, to use your own words, have the freest possible trade in goods and services between Britain and the EU while you take the UK out of the single market which allows precisely that? But above all, how can you reconcile a hard Brexit with your own stated desire of a more united UK and your claim to represent every person in the United Kingdom, including the large number of people, especially the young generation who voted in favour of remaining in the European Union. Resolving those contradictions so as to minimise damage to our citizens must be the objective of the negotiations to come. And if we want common sense and the general interest to prevail, we must ignore those who shout and posture. And I agree with you, Mrs May, when you say you want to build a stronger, fairer, better Britain. Achieving stronger, fairer and better societies is a goal that many share in this chamber. Delivering this requires us to face the Trumps and the Putins of this world, to tackle climate change, to fight terrorism and organised crime, to find common responses to the global migration challenge, to curb corporate power. And who can believe? Who seriously can believe when EU citizens all together represent 7% of the global population on 2% of the land that any, I say any, of our member states, including the largest, can, is better equipped to face these challenges on its own? Mrs. May, like it or not, we're in this together. Taking back control, being recognized as global players, requires all Europeans, including Britons, to act together. There is no such thing as absolute sovereignty. In the 21st century, we can only reconquer sovereignty for democracies by sharing it. Mrs May, you want to build a Britain your children and grandchildren are proud to call home. Let me remind you that as we speak, many of your own citizens are proud to call not just Britain, but Europe home. Let us not let them down. Thank you very much. On behalf of the uh, EFDD group, the floor goes to Mr Farage. Good morning. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Well, it may have taken nine months, a pretty full gestation, but be in no doubt that last Wednesday was a great historic day when the United Kingdom announced that we were going to become an independent, self-governing, democratic nation once again, an act that has been cheered by hundreds of millions of people all over the world. Now, we've had a little history lesson this morning from Mr Verhofstadt, but he made one mistake. In 1973, sir, we did not join the European Union. We joined the European Economic Community. And had the British people known that it was intended to get political and take away our ability to govern ourselves, we never would. Now, I'm, I'm sorry to say that the response to the triggering of Article 50 has been all too predictable. Already you've made a series of demands that are not just unreasonable, but in some cases clearly impossible for Britain to comply with. You began by telling us that we have to pay a bill, a cool 52 billion sterling, a figure that has clearly been plucked out of the air, effectively a form of ransom demand. What you could have acknowledged is that we've put net 
over 200 billion sterling into this project. We're actually shareholders in this building and the rest of the assets, and really, you should be making us an offer we can't refuse to go. And the ever charming Mr. Verhofstadt, the Parliament's chief negotiator, in his resolution that we're to vote on later today, tells us that we cannot discuss potential trade deals with anybody else in the world until we've left the European Union. That has no basis in treaty law whatsoever. And it's rather like saying you can't guarantee yourself a dwelling for when you leave prison and I trust the British government will completely ignore you. And of course Mr Tusk, who is not with us today, um, I suspect that he's still crying. He looked pretty tearful, didn't he, after the British ambassador delivered the letter last week. He tells us in his memorandum that any future trade deal must ensure that the United Kingdom is not allowed to have a competitive advantage. This is all impossible, and you add to that, you add to that the hypocrisy of, on the one hand, saying the EU will negotiate as one, and Clause 22 of the Tusk document saying that actually Gibraltar, that the Spanish can have a total veto over the whole trade deal if they're not happy with the sovereignty of Gibraltar. We believe in national self-determination. Your aim and ambition is to destroy nation-state democracy. Gibraltar is clearly a deal-breaker on current terms. You have shown yourselves with these demands to be vindictive, to be nasty. All I can say is, thank goodness, we're leaving. You're behaving like the Mafia. You think we're a hostage. We're not. We're free to go. We're free to go. And 85... And this... No. This... Now, I know. I know. I do understand. Honourable Farage. I do understand Honourable Farage. Sorry, Mr Farage. Listen, I'm trying to give you the chance to speak and say everything you want to say. But if you're talking about the Mafia, you're saying this Parliament is behaving like the Mafia. As far as I'm concerned, that's unacceptable. Oh, I do understand. I do understand, sir, Mr. President. I do understand national sensitivities. I'll change it to gangsters. All right? And that is how, and that is how we're being treated. We're being given a ransom note. But what must be very difficult for all of you to get into your minds is there is a bigger world out there than the European Union. 85% of the global economy is outside the European Union. And if you wish to have no deal, if you wish to force us to walk away from the table, it is not us that will be hurt. Do you know, we don't have to buy German motor cars. We don't have to drink French wine. We don't have to eat Belgian chocolate. There are a lot of other people that will give that to us. A return to tariffs, a return to tariffs will risk the jobs of hundreds of thousands of people living in the European Union and yet what you're saying is you want to put the interests of the European Union above that of your citizens and your companies. And if you continue with that route, it won't just be the United Kingdom that triggers Article 50, there'll be many more to come. On behalf of the Europe of Nations and Freedoms Group, Mr De Graaf. Mr President, I send my congratulations to Ms. Theresa May, to the United Kingdom and the British people. And I say to them, you have regained your freedom and your sovereignty by invoking Article 50 by leaving the European Union. You have now regained the opportunity to flourish as a nation, to control your borders, to make your own laws, to make your own trade deals. The bureaucrats from the EU will try to make you pay about 60 billion. They'll try to force you to comply with all EU directives and standards and to accept hundreds of thousands of migrants, to accept even the rulings of the, Euro the European Court of Justice. They will try to open an Ireland road for migrants to the UK. I say to you, don't give in to these demands. You're far better off outside the EU, a union which is going the way of more and more isolation. And they are calling you friend here, friend. But they want to punish you and make you bleed. 
Let me therefore remind you of the famous words of Sir Winston Churchill, we shall defend our island, whatever the costs may be. We shall fight on the beaches, we shall fight on the landing grounds, we shall fight in the fields and in the streets, we shall fight in the hills, we shall never surrender. God bless the United Kingdom. The floor goes to Mr. Wolfe on behalf of the non-attached members. Thank you, Mr. President. As Brexit negotiations begin, it is a joy to watch the towering masters in the art of EU diplomacy in full flow here today. Those like Mr. Weber, whose bellicose, threatening and theatrical words no doubt entertain this chamber, but are like a pen with no point in the negotiating rooms. He said on his recent tour of the British media that politicians who fought for Brexit were allowed to grow up in a free Europe and that the UK should now pay more. Well, Mr Weber, may I remind you that the freedom that you say you promote came at a mighty cost to Britain. It came in the blood and sacrifice of millions of Britons, those who, like my grandfather, when asked, unhesitatingly fought in the sands of Africa so Europe can be free. It came in the 120 billion it cost Britain to fight a German dictator. It came in the 5 trillion Britain contributed to NATO to help build a shield of freedom around Europe from communism. It came on the 500 billion or more we have contributed to the EU and the billions more we spend each day more than we receive. Mr. Weber, on Radio 4 you asked, Mrs. May, Please tell me what leaving the EU means. Well, I will tell you. It means we are leaving a European Union that has forgotten the costs and sacrifices Britons freely gave to ensure you are free to ex exercise your diplomacy of the defeated in this chamber of the forgetful. Thank you. A nome del Consiglio prende ora la parola On behalf of the Council, Ian Borg. Grazie, Sir President. Thank you, Chair. Members, President of the Commission, Mr. Barnier. As many said last week, finally the notification letter arrived in the hands of Mr. Tusk, and we saw the reaction of the European Council to this notification. As you all know, a few hours later President Tusk met also the presidency, the, the rotating presidency of the Council, and we could see the first reactions uh, from that meeting. Now, although a few have referred to the 29th of March as a historic day, I think such discussions and debates like we're holding today should, in fact, be held. And we should have non-hysterical debates, and everyone should be free to um, voice his opinion on this separation with the UK. And I think the only way, the only positive outcome will be possible if we keep in mind the best interests of European citizens, of European businesses. And we also need to work to reduce the negative impact that they can be. We know that this is a loss for the Union and it's a loss for both parts and it is crucial to minimise negative impacts on, on European citizens. And thus we can reach a balance between rights and obligations. The European Council's position following the letter by Prime Minister May has been published. And I believe that was the 
first step we took to show that the 27 member states are united and they just have one unified message about this situation. It is crucial now that we keep this unity in the coming weeks until, until the guidelines are adopted by the Council And uh, in the light of this, we can work all together as one union. As you know, there will be a uh, council meeting on the 29th of April, during which we will agree on the uh, guidelines for negotiations. So I think it's a good thing that we are discussing here today. It's a and uh, it's a good, to, it's a very good moment to um, to voice our opinion on the negotiations. I would like to remind you that even the Prime Minister of Malta, when he was addressing this Parliament, he had underlined, in fact, how crucial it is that a democratic institution like this is uh, at the heart of the process, is kept at the heart of the process, not only because that is what the treaties say, but because that's how it should be. And um, I can assure you that the Prime Minister and the Maltese Presidency have voiced uh, that position in every meeting during these last three months. Now, I know that priorities and principles are similar from both sides. I know that you also believe that the interests of our citizens should be given priority during the negotiations. Yes, of course, there will, uh, there will have to be a financial settlement. We need to discuss that, and that also should be a priority. And from then, there we can uh, determine the approach we, can, we, we shall take for the uh, negotiations. We believe that the union should work with uh, sincere cooperation until the, the UK leaves the EU. After we agree on the uh, guidelines and the Council, then the Council will immediately implement the decision and will authorise the beginning of negotiations and the uh, and the rest of uh, directives that we are working on in a parallel fashion. The formal negotiations will start towards the end of the Maltese Presidency when, the, uh, uh, when there will be talks about the negotiating directives. Now, Today we're focusing on Brexit here this morning, but the EU has a more positive agenda to discuss and to decide on, an agenda that favours the interests of European citizens. So it's important to reach a balance. Yes, we do need to take uh, Brexit negotiations seriously, but in the same way, the Maltese presidency, and I'm sure also the coming presidencies, and you as Parliament, I'm sure we are all committed to continue working on the various dossiers we need to work on in order to continue to deliver positive answers that European citizens are ultimately expecting from us. I'm sure that you will also be working hand in hand with other institutions in order to be able to achieve this in the weeks and months to come. This will also allow us to honour and to implement what the 27 member states agreed on in Rome and that will determine Europe's future and it will determine um, the answers that we can give to European citizens in the coming years. So I believe we should take a constructive approach towards all of this. Currently, arrangements are being made within the Council so that 
the work that needs to be carried out in the coming months can be done in the uh, uh, most tranquil of manners and we uh, hope that the uh, work that we can do together as 27 member states will allow us to reach our aims as I said I am convinced that if the EU works in an effective manner, we can achieve the best possible results for us and for our citizens. Thank you. The floor goes to the President of the European Commission, Jean-Claude Juncker. President, buongiorno, honourable members, the Council, ladies and gentlemen, there is no better place to start a debate on our negotiations with the United Kingdom than in the place where they are supposed to end in less than two years' time. In a defining and challenging moment for our Union, the role of this Parliament is more important than ever. You must scrutinize and validate the final agreement. No negotiation, no separation without representation. This is the reason that, from the very start, I pushed this House to have a full and active role in the process. I would like to thank and congratulate my friend Guy Verhofstadt and all parties involved for the speed and clarity of the resolution that we are voting on today. I will not give a detailed response today on each point, but given the cross-party support in this House, it is clear that we are on the same lines when it comes to the big issues. And that is absolutely crucial because this is the time to stay united, this is the time to stay undivided. During these negotiations, every one of our institutions and every one of our 27 member states must be signing from the same hymn suite. The stronger we are at 27, the stronger will be in the negotiation. You already know our chief negotiator, Michel Barnier, very well. But over the course of the next two years, you will become even more familiar with him. I have to say, before the start of the negotiations, that he is doing a good job. Sometimes, not very often, I'm taking wrong decisions. But, uh, don't laugh. <laughs> but one of the best decisions I have taken since I'm President of the Commission was the appointment of Michel Barnier as our Chief Negotiator. <clears throat> it is normal that your Parliament will have a say on the final deal. But more important, you are the checks and the balances during the negotiations themselves. This is fundamentally a, question, a constitutional question for our Union. A third country cannot have the same benefits as a member state. This Parliament must and will ensure that this reality is fully upheld over the course of the next two years. We will, of course, negotiate in friendship and openness, not in an hostile mood, with a country that has brought so much to our Union and will remain close to our hearts long after they have left. But this is now the time for reason over emotion. President. President, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues. In these negotiations, what's at stake is not just treaties and paragraphs and provisions. It's not just a diplomatic ping-pong or intergovernmental blah-blah. Uh, what what's at stake here are the lives of millions of people. Millions have uh, family or professional links to the United Kingdom. They have taken life decisions they have 
thrown themselves into their work with confidence in uh, the uh, trustworthiness of the European Union. They've sent their children to school. They've set up successful businesses. They have built a, a, a life that they expected to uh, be able to continue. And if we do all of this, we have to uh, work on their behalf. The Commission is speaking to uh, all of those directly affected uh, on both this side and the other side of the channel. Workers, students, pensioners should not be the ones who pay the price for Brexit. People are not negotiating chips. People cannot end up being uh, uh, simply exchanged in the negotiations. That's part of our negotiating mandate and that's uh, why we want to ensure that Brexit will not throw people into uncertainty. That also applies to all of those who are dependent on European projects, projects that have already been planned and have been uh, uh, already agreed to. Commitments that have already been ent entered into should definitely be respected. A disorderly separation is the worst possible case. No deal would be the worst case scenario for many people and for many families. It would bring disadvantages for research, for cooperation, for trade. No deal means no winners. Everybody will lose. That's why we will uh, proceed with negotiations with the UK to try and reduce the damage caused to people, to trade, and to societies. Will we miss the UK? Yes, but without naivet naivety. Now, I want to say this to uh, Mr. Farage. It's not the European Union that is leaving the UK. It is the UK that is leaving the European Union. Our divorce lawyers, primarily Michel Barnier, will now be looking into the details. We will have to divide up the achievements that we have made over the last... Uh, 40 or so years, uh, not without uh, crisis in the past. But that is one of the preconditions for putting our future partnership on a firm foundation. Solid partnerships can only be rebuilt, uh, rebuilt after clear uh, uh, sorting out of uh, previous relationship. We cannot talk about the future at this point, the questions about the future can only be dealt with when the questions arising from the past are fully resolved. Monsieur le Président, Mesdames. President, ladies and gentlemen, members, the choice of the United Kingdom to leave the European Union is indeed a choice that will uh, bring an end to uh, the EU with 28 members and that makes us sad, profoundly sad. The choice of the British people, however respectable that may be, does not fit into the march of history, not European history and not global history. The separation that's been announced will lead to a new birth, the birth of, a, of an EU with 27 members. This EU with 27 members is already up and running and functioning. Since September last year, the 27 members have met. We met in Bratislava to put forward a route map which sets out our priorities for the coming years. This work continued in the uh, Malta summit in February and uh, 
fed into the uh, document produced of the celebrations for the uh, 60th anniversary of the Treaty of Rome on the, 27th of, uh, the 25th of March. So we've dissolved our vows of uh, marriage, but we feel that we have done our duty, our continental duty, but we will continue to build the European construction with energy and indeed with renewed energy. When we met in Rome and at the same time in many European cities there was a popular mobilization on the streets and there was a, a vigorous dem demonstration of confidence in the European project and I must say that all of those who s stood in our streets and marched for Europe, they remind me of the founding fathers of Europe, and I say that with some emotion. Today we must make choices, choices about the manner in which we want to work, to act and to make progress together. This debate can be based upon the white paper produced by the Commission. The debate on the future of the EU has to be held across Europe, together with national parliaments, together with our regions. We need to work together with our civil societies, our artists and creators, and without their contribution, we would not have become what we are today. The choice that we are making today, the choices we'll be making tomorrow and in the coming years, have to take into account implications not only for the European Union, but the consequences for the generations to come. History will judge us not upon uh, just what we have done, but what we have left to future generations. Thank you very much for your attention. I'll now give the floor to Michel Barnier. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. President, and good morning to everybody. Honorable members, I'd like to thank the President to give, for, for giving me this opportunity to address uh, this House as uh, Chief Negotiator. I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Jean-Claude Juncker for the trust he has placed in me. I'd like to thank all of you for the work that's already been done under the aegis of President uh, Tajani in the political groups and committees. I'd like to thank uh, Guy Verhofstadt and his team. Your work has been constructive and uh, uh, effective and I'm sure it will continue to be so. Honourable members, your resolution will be the first uh, political standpoint issued by a European Union institution to the letter addressed last week by Prime Minister Theresa May to the President of the European Council. That being the case, you set the tone as you address the British government, the EU27, and the citizens of Europe. As for uh, ourselves, we also understand there will be a message addressed to us. Our shared objective is a successful negotiation, a successful agreement, and that requires three conditions to be fulfilled, and let me run through them now. Firstly, as has been highlighted by Jean-Claude Juncker, we need unity. United, we can better defend the interests of the 27 EU member states and their citizens. And as the various presidents of political groups have said, we also defend the fundamental principles and values that the European Union, uh, the European project has been based on since its very inception. Unity is necessary for the Union, but also for our partners in the UK.
a disunited union could actually lead to there being no agreement. And it's important for us all to understand that. Philippe Lambert said uh, earlier, no deal would have very serious consequences, first and foremost for the United Kingdom, but also for the European Union. Hence, let me say again, the no deal scenario is not the scenario we're looking for. We're looking for success. Success not against the United Kingdom, but with the United Kingdom. The UK, and I very much heard the words of Helga Stevens and her appeal earlier this morning. This requires us to explain what we are doing and why we are doing it. We need to speak the truth to our citizens. We need to say impassively and objectively what Brexit means, what it means to be leaving the European Union. This negotiation must also have a pedagogical dimension. Uh, day in, day out, we need to rediscover the achievements we have made together because all too often we forget the benefits for citizens, consumers and businesses of what we've been doing. Our unity, honourable members, will be all the stronger if it is public uh, unity. We intend to negotiate in a transparent fashion. The, these uh, extraordinary negotiations are not going to be secret negotiations. The second condition, we have to dispel uncertainty. We need to spread certainty and legal certainty because in certain respects the, e the UK withdrawing from the EU creates uncertainty for the citizens, for the beneficiaries of uh, EU spending and at the EU's borders. In, in your name I will be defending clear principles. continuity and the reciprocity of law. That is my guarantee to the citizens of the European Union and the United Kingdom without discrimination until uh, the day of withdrawal. And I very much heard Mr. Pitella on this subject. Theresa May's uh, letter seeks a rapid agreement but honourable members, the devil is quite clearly going to be in the detail and the six months of work done so far uh, points to that. Uh, President Juncker has explained quite clearly that it will be the role of the European Parliament to be vigilant in this process. A single financial settlement uh, as a result of the UK's commitments to the EU and the EU's commitments to the UK. There your resolution is very clear. We do not seek to punish the United Kingdom. We are simply asking the United Kingdom to deliver on its commitments and undertakings as a member of the European Union. In fact, Mr. Farage, all we're doing is settling the accounts. No more and no less. And now to the borders, not least Ireland, to which Gabriela Zimmer pointed. We will have to find arrangements that don't upset the existing fragile balance in the uh, dialogue, notably the Good Friday Agreement. And our solutions will have to be compatible, of course, with EU law. Order and putting them into perspective. The UK letter makes clear that the UK government will push for parallel negotiations on the Wills rule and the future relations. This is 
a very risky approach. To succeed, we need, on the contrary, to devote the first phase of negotiations exclusively to reaching an agreement on the principles of the exit. We are not proposing this to be tactical or create difficulties for the UK. On the contrary, it is an essential condition to maximize our chances to reach an agreement together within two years, which is very short. This is also our best chance to build trust, as Manfred Weber mentioned very clearly, to, best, to, to build trust before proceeding to the second phase of negotiations. This second phase will be devoted to scoping our future relation and to discussing necessary transitory arrangements. To put, it, to put it differently, the sooner we agree on the principles of an orderly withdrawal, the sooner we can prepare our future relation. In trade, obviously, a free and fair, free and fair trade agreement, a level playing field but also in security and defence. It is on the basis of these three conditions, unity, lifting uncertainty, and phasing of negotiations, that we can succeed. And your resolution will set the tone. My hope is that the European Parliament makes these three conditions its own. Pour finir, mesdames et messieurs, to conclude, honourable members of the European Parliament, Mr. President, let me say a few words about the work we're going to do together up until the end. Mr. Juncker has uh, described our essential uh, role right up until the end. Uh, we start with your resolution, and in two years' time, we will have your uh, vote on the withdrawal. And you will have honourable members, the last word. It is in the European Parliament that the democratic debate underpinning this negotiation will take place. And this is not going to be a negotiation like any other. This debate will take place here and in the member states. And this debate is essential to make Brexit a success and to put in place successful arrangements for the future, arrangements which will have to be ratified by this parliament and the parliaments of the member states. All the way, we'll be working together. And it is therefore a pleasure to address you today. I'm glad to have had this opportunity to address you in the presence of President Juncker and uh, the uh, Maltese Presidency. I look forward to continuing to work uh, with President Tusk and the European Council on the eve of the extraordinary meeting of the 29th of April. I shall continue to work uh, with you, your conference of presidents, your conference of committee chairs, all of your political groups. I am here uh, at your disposal, as is my team. Thank you very much indeed. The next speaker is Mr. Estelan González Pons. Over the last 300 years, British politicians have dealt skillfully with the world of politics, and that meant that that was part of the very essence of being English or British. However, now they've got it wrong. They're wrong because they are seen to be refusing solidarity. They're leaving, but they want to tell us how to act and how to organize ourselves with the Conservatives telling us how to organize a future European Union, members of which they'll no longer be. They're wrong because they are preventing Scotland staying part of Europe, while at the same time they want to prevent Gibraltar, or enable Gibraltar to continue to be a tax haven. Just seven days after Brexit, we're hearing all sorts of outbursts of racism and some members of the British Parliament are talking about the words war when we're referring to Spain. They want to have the same rights, the same opportunities, the same chances when they were members of the European Union. They've got it wrong, though. 
they seem to believe that Europeans would have a, a war than a good agreement. They're wrong if the European Union, except the European Union, is divisible. The, European, the EUK is also divisible. They're also wrong if they s believe that the EU won't defend all its member states and their interests, that will simply give in. Europe and the European Union is the biggest market in the world. It's also the largest area of peace, security and prosperity in the world. Europe is the world's largest survivor of uh, pr pr provider of social services. It's the great survivor of the 20th century. We will not simply surrender. You're absolutely wrong if you think that we're not sad that you're leaving. We're profoundly sad. Unfortunately, this time it's the UK which has chosen the wrong road in history. I say this with a profound sense of friendship. I say this with a sense of loyalty. You have got it wrong. You are going to commit self-harm while at the same time harming all of us. Once again, with a sense of friendship, I hope you think, think again and get it right. I hope that you won't be blinded by arrogance. Thank you. La parola ora all'onorevole. The next speaker is Mr. Gualtieri. President, with this, with this resolution, the European Parliament takes a clear, strong, and balanced position on the negotiations with the United Kingdom. We regret the decision to leave the EU, but we respect it. We also know, and will not forget, that the large number of UK citizens voted to remain because they understand that the European project is the only way to protect and to recover our sovereignty in the globalized world. Our guiding principle in the whole process will be to protect the rights and interests of the citizens we directly represent. We want to ensure an orderly withdrawal of the UK from the EU, avoiding a no-deal scenario which would have negative consequences for all but in particular for the United Kingdom. For this reason, we call on the UK government to agree as soon as possible on the principles of the withdrawal provisions in order to allow to begin talks on the main features of the future relationships and on the necessary transitional arrangements. We fully support the sequencing exposed by Michel Barnier. In this context, the Parliament will pay particular attention to the need to protect the rights of the U27 citizens living on heavily lived in the UK and vice versa, because people, as President Juncker said, are not negotiating chips. We will also ensure that the financial settlement will cover all the commitments and liabilities, and we will insist on the absolute need to safeguard the Northern Ireland peace process and to avoid a hardening of the border in Ireland. The future relationship between the EU and the UK should be a close partnership based on balanced and comprehensive agreement, but it could not provide similar benefits to those enjoyed by the Union Member State. The European Parliament will not accept any trade-off between security and economy, nor any cherry-picking, and we will want an agreement which is fully in line with our standards on environment, fight against tax evasion and protection of social rights. I'm confident that the vote will show that this Parliament is united along this principle, that we back the EU negotiator and that we will honour our constitutional obligations contributing to the unity of the EU to a successful negotiation and to the defense of our common values and project. Ci sono ancora 50 We still have 50 MEPs who wish to speak in this debate. Given the specific circumstances, there will be no catch the eye session at the end of the debate. Our next speaker is Mr. Fox. Thank you, President. Last week, Prime Minister May triggered Article 50. In doing so, she gave effect to the democratic decision of the British people to leave the European Union. I want members to see today as a beginning and not an end. It is the start of a new relationship between the European Union and the United Kingdom. Although we will be leaving the EU, 
we want to forge a deep and special partnership with our friends and allies in Europe. The negotiations that follow will be difficult at times and you'll sometimes hear an angry voice. I hope that colleagues here will focus on the outcome we seek and not the process we undertake because we all need a good agreement rather than a good fight. This Parliament has a role to play in ensuring we protect our citizens. I want the rights of all EU citizens in the UK and all British citizens in the EU to be guaranteed. I want Britain's borders with the EU to be as invisible as possible, to allow as much trade as possible. And I want us to respect the right of self-determination. Mr. President, the sovereignty of Gibraltar is not part of these negotiations. My group was disappointed with Mr. that Mr. Verhofstadt felt he could only consult on the draft text with a few close political friends. And we also regret that he ignored so much good work by the Parliament's committees. Perhaps it was inconvenient. We hope in future we can work with you in the same good faith and full transparency that you request in your motion. As we look to the future, it is in the interests of all our citizens that we reach a comprehensive agreement between Britain and the EU. We see no reason to delay any aspect of any of these talks. So let us go forward together and reach that deep and special partnership that will benefit all our nations. Thank you. The next speaker is Ms Bearder. Lies and blatant mistruths of the referendum campaign are crumbling before our eyes. They told us food prices would not rise. They have. They told us businesses would not move abroad. They are. They told us we were scaremongering. We were not. 16 million Brits did not say they wanted to leave the European family. Those who did won't be fooled again by the false promises from nationalists. This month of May, the British people will send a message to Mrs May in local elections and the Westminster seat of Manchester Gorton. That message reads loud and clear. You lied to us. We are angry and we want our country back. It belongs inside the European Union. As a Liberal Democrat, I will continue to fight against Brexit and to give the people a final say on the, say on the deal. I am proud of this House uniting with a positive but firm resolution. It is fair, it is just, and it is very European. And if the deal goes badly, the British people will welcome the chance to revoke Brexit and Article 50 and vote to remain. Thank you, Madam Chairman. President. Thank you. I now give the floor for two minutes to Mrs. Anderson. Today in this chamber, the influence of the late Martin McGuinness is present. He met with virtually every signature of, signatory of the joint resolution, and he asked three things from you. One, that you preserve the Good Friday Agreement in all its parts. Two, that there would be no hardening of the Irish border. And three, that the unique circumstances and special status of Ireland would be supported. In his memory, we thank you for this. This is why we associate ourselves with this resolution. We feel that the European Parliament is a partner to the people of the north of Ireland and particularly those living across the partitioned border areas, north and south. And no other MEP understands the disaster of partition than MEP Matt Carthy. Despite the fact that we support the joint resolution, we all have to recognise that this is not the Europe that we want or that the people need. We need an open and critical debate on the future of Europe, something that the resolution also calls for. We need to engage the public in this debate. Together, we can shape a better Europe, 
a more social Europe, a democratic Europe, a Europe of equals. We've done our part. Now it's a turn of the European Council meeting on the 29th of April. To the European Council, I say, it's over to you. And to Kenny, Taoiseach, your day has come. Now it's your time to stand up for the Good Friday Agreement in all of its parts. Irish citizens are depending on you. You must be the voice of the people north and south. It's clear from this resol resolution that Ireland has friends in Europe. And I want to end with a quote from Manfred Weber, somebody that I don't usually quote from. He said, if the UK tries to endanger the Good Friday Agreement, we will not give our support to an agreement on Brexit. Neither will we, neither should the Taoiseach. So harness that support, Enda, and stand up for Ireland. Our next speaker for one minute, Mr. Terry Cabras. Gracias, señora Presidenta. Almost everything has been said on Brexit, even if nothing has been done so far. I will just underline four ideas that seem to me of the utmost importance on the subject. One, the resolution of this Parliament voted today sets the framework of any future negotiation. Five parliamentary groups have happily presented it. Two, both parts have to concentrate on fair and discreet negotiations conducted in a spirit of good faith and political rigour. Three, we will have to learn to divorce, since we have not been able to learn to live better together. That means we have to prepare a future that can make possible to combine the distance with the collaboration. Four, finally, as President of IFA, I wish to express my conviction that both parts will be able to give a fair treatment, not just to the territories that express their will to remain, Scotland, North of Ireland and Gibraltar, but also to Wales. We have a long way in front of us. Let's honour each other, at least with two virtues, with loyalty and courage. Gracias, Señora Presidenta. Two minutes, Mr. Nuttall. Thank you. Uh, I think what we've witnessed over the past week has been the unedifying spectacle of posturing unveiled threats. From the ludicrous suggestion that we will be saddled with a £50 billion divorce bill, although we're a net contributor to the EU budget, to the claim that no trade deal will be negotiated until the end of the Article 50 process. This I guarantee would cause immense damage to the economies of the European Union and would result in putting many of your citizens out of work. It's what we call in the UK cutting off your nose to spite your face. However, the most offensive position that you have taken is the proposal that Spain will have the right to veto any Brexit deal over the issue of Gibraltar. I want to make it clear in this chamber today, the people of Gibraltar are proudly British. In 2002, 99% of Gibraltarians voted in a referendum against shared sovereignty with Spain and the wishes of the people should be upheld. I do, however, have a solution to prevent Gibraltar being used as a pawn in Brexit negotiations and indeed end Spanish claims once and for all. Make Gibraltar a fully integrated part of the UK. Give her and our other overseas territories their own Member of Parliament. Give Gibraltar real influence and a voice in Westminster and send a clear message that Gibraltar is not for sale. In this area, we, the UK, can learn from our continental cousins because the French give representation to their overseas territories and I propose that we should too. I have been calling this for many, many years and with the unique opportunities that Brexit has given us, I believe it is an idea whose time has come. Thank you. And now, for one and a half minutes, Mrs Atkinson. 
you know, I know what a divorce is like. I came through one, and you will too. Um, both parties seek to damage each other and the kids and blame each other. You know, the kids and the bank accounts get damaged. But my ex-partner, you will recover. Your hate will lessen, but you'll need a bit of counselling along the way. Jean-Claude, get off the, balls, uh, the booze. Donald's in denial. He's in depression, trying to claim Gibraltar as his own, as so often happens when you're splitting the, the divorce assets. And then you appoint a crack team of negotiators, only to find you've got Mrs. Malmstrom in there, and that she's not a trade negotiator at all. She's a sociology lecturer. And, Guy, you sent in your army, you sent in your balmy army, sort of the one Spanish armada that's left to you to retake Gibraltar, but it didn't happen. And Northern Ireland, the only way that the Good Friday Peace Agreement is going to fail is if you start bombing us again. And one, thing, one party thinks you owe them a bonus and an income for life just because they're injured. But our bill to you is one trillion pounds of contributions. That's been the amount of money that we've paid into this place. And you fouled us, so we want that back. So it's not going very well. But do you know what? We don't want to damage you. We don't want to damage the kids and your finances. Um, so let's complete a free trade agreement. Because if not, our friends at the, F at the World Trade Organization are looking jolly nice and very attractive. And I'm not seeking an affair in this divorce, but a partner for life. And I think that's where we're heading. Mrs. Dodds, one and a half minutes. Thank you. The triggering of Article 50 was a good day for democracy in the United Kingdom. The Prime Minister upheld the democratic result of the referendum when the UK voted decisively to leave the European Union last June. However, I respect that for many in this place there is genuine disappointment, maybe some sadness, even some anger. In the negotiation to come on all sides, emotion must be tempered by a practical and positive willingness to find common ground. We have an opportunity to write a new chapter on cooperation in trade, security and prosperity. Whilst I have many difficulties with the text, not least on phasing, on finance, on trade, on Gibraltar, I am pleased that this resolution does recognise Northern Ireland's unique position in respect of the land border with the Republic of Ireland. Both the United Kingdom and the Irish governments have said there will be no return to a hard border. The Council's draft guidelines pledge a flexible and imaginative approach. All of these commitments are welcome. However, any solution must also respect that Northern Ireland will be an integral part of an independent United Kingdom. I hear and appreciate support for the peace process in this House. The greatest support for the process will come from stable government, and my party pledges to work hard to ensure that in this and in the outcome of Brexit, we will represent the best interests of Northern Ireland. Herr Brock, two minutes. Frau Präsidentin. Madam President, Presidents of the Commission and Council, ladies and gentlemen, back in 1975, I took part in a demonstration in London which called for the U UK to stay in the EU. Back at that time, Britain was uh, afflicted by strikes and industrial disputes, social uh, disputes. The UK has become strong thanks to the, uh, uh, the membership of the UK and the EU. Thatcher was uh, at that same demonstration back in 1975. That's uh, what all made the uh, Maastricht Treaty possible. Mr Farage, all of the... Uh, treaties have been fully ratified by the British government. Europe today has legitimacy, legitimacy that has been given to it by the UK. Ladies and gentlemen, we want constructive negotiations, fair negotiations, no revenge. We all have uh, common interests, but if you're going to carry the burdens of the single market and the customs union, then 
you can't just save the, 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 all of your disadvantages that, that, that with the afterwards with through a trade treaty. It's only fair that you don't have the same treatment as you'd get if you were a member. Now, okay, we've got the divorce contract and we've got the uh, uh, trade agreements to go into, but remember, it's in British interest to be involved in security cooperation. It's in our co common interests. I think that that's something that the UK can underst underst understand. I think it's just a misunderstanding rather than a threat that could suggest you could pull out of that. Now, of course, there's going to be some kind of uh, transitional agreement, and this has to be uh, voted for in the European Parliament, as will the final result of the treaty. So, for Ireland and all of the others, we have to struggle for the EU with 27 members to define, uh, defend the citizens' rights in the north of Ireland and in the Republic of Ireland and across the European Union. We do not want to hear any more war rhetoric as we've heard over Gibraltar. Europe has brought freedom for 70 years. The UK, a great country, has to work in favour of peace and freedom and we don't want to hear more warlike rhetoric. We have to work together to build our future rather than retreating to nationalist uh, forms of debate from the past. Thanks. Thank you. One and a half minutes, Mr. Hauria Atondo. Thank you, Madam President. I would like to start by telling the honourable members that there have been a series of speakers this morning who I found struck uh, a use, uh, an unnecessarily aggressive tone, and I don't think that's the right for way forward these very important negotiations. First of all, I would like to reiterate that we need demanding negotiations when it comes to the exit conditions. Europe is fully entitled to establish clear, clear conditions ensuring that people who leave the club don't do so without cost, that it's better to stay than to leave. For pedagogical reasons, the European Union has to establish this so as to ensure its own survival. Secondly, I'd like to point out to Mr Barnier that it might be very important that while negotiating the UK's withdrawal from the European Union, we establish a framework protecting the rights of the four million citizens, British and European, who live on our continent. That should take place at the same time as the withdrawal negotiations. Thirdly, I would like to reiterate what I think should be the end point of these negotiations. We all have to work to reach an agreement. However, ladies and gentlemen, any such an agreement must be based on a desire to live together, and that includes Gibraltar. Spain has no intention whatsoever of fighting over sovereignty with Gibraltar. However, Spain has a long-standing claim, which still remains valid, and we want to negotiate. But it's quite unacceptable in the 21st century that we have a colony here in Europe, and I hope that you'll understand the posi Spanish position on this. Thank you. One minute, Mr. Vistason. Brexit, air, uh, Brexit is not uh, the illness but the symptom. The illness is the kind of thoughts we see sometimes in the EU and certainly here in the Parliament that people want this project to become a federal superstate. One thing we can learn from Brexit, if people want to continue having a common army, common initiatives, if we want to follow Mr. Verhofstadt's big project, a new constitution for Europe, which will lead to a super state, if we do that, then Brexit will just be the first of many member states that do not want to continue in the EU. This is also why it's regrettable that the resolution mentions all the things we cannot do, all the things that the UK is not allowed to do. This is obviously meant to uh, frighten away other countries from doing what the U UK has done. But this is a wrong thing to say. We should not punish the UK. We should look at our common possibilities in the future. If we decide to punish the UK, then other people will, w other countries will want to leave the Union. We need common trade and common security, most of all. Mrs. Harkin, one minute. 
Thank you, Chair. In my one minute, I will concentrate on how Brexit affects the island of Ireland. The words Ireland and Northern Ireland appear eight times in the document we are discussing today, and that in itself indicates the importance that the European Parliament attaches to the unique position and special circumstances confronting the island of Ireland. It is crucial to safeguard peace and therefore to preserve the Good Friday Agreement in all its parts. We insist on the absolute need to ensure continuity and stability of the Northern Ireland peace process and avoid the re-establishment of a hard border. Those are not my words. Those words are written in the document we will agree today. So we start with good intent. But over the next few months, all of us will have to come forward with workable solutions that will make a reality of those fine words. We share a border of almost 500 kilometres with Northern Ireland. We must maintain our common travel area. Otherwise, the dislocation could be catastrophic for our small island. Finally, I want to agree with Michel Barnier that we should ensure free and fair trade agreement with a level playing field. That must be also the outcome between the Republic and Northern Ireland. Two minutes. Madam Spinelli. Sono d'accordo con l'impianto della risoluzione. I agree with the thrust of the joint resolution, although it doesn't actually contain the self-critical notes I'd like to have seen. When it comes to defending the rights of citizens, that's more precise, I think, than in the Council guidelines. Our battle for Brexit starts today. I hope that everybody will retain absolute vigilance on two essential points. First of all, the rights of Northern Ireland as set out in the Good Friday Agreement and those of the millions of EU and non-EU citizens who live in the UK. In Ireland, war and peace are at stake, while for our citizens, the founding principles and values of the European Union are at stake. I prefer to talk about founding principles, in fact, rather than the word values, since that can be interpreted in a very subjective way. So, from this point of view, I find Brexit a source of great concern. Millions of EU citizens in the UK and British citizens in the EU run the risk of being deprived of their fundamental social and civic rights as currently guaranteed by European law. One of the main purposes of Brexit and the so-called Great Repeal Bill, which will cancel those rights, is to move towards an even more deregulated economy possibly being followed by withdrawal from the European Convention on Human Rights. That's what the Brexit campaign has led to. Vulnerable citizens will, in all likelihood, not take back the control they want. They will probably lose it even more. And they will lose many of the valuable rights which have been protected up until now. Uh, the the role of the European Parliament is to ensure that Northern Ireland and impoverished citizens have guaranteed rights. It's also up to us to understand the errors we've made in the past, moving towards the building of a social Europe which reverses the rejection of so many of its citizens. And this is something which we started to understand now here in Europe. And now one minute, Mrs. Scott Cato. Thank you, President. I campaign for the European Union as a peace project and a beacon for democracy and human rights. The journey towards Brexit is proving how powerful the Union has been in this civilising mission and how flimsy these basic freedoms seem without European support. The vote for Brexit has been hijacked to build an ugly coalition to undermine our civilised society. Within a week of triggering Article 50, we have a senior Conservative threatening war against a European country. This is sadly symbolic of the loss of commitment to peace and to basic standards of diplomacy to say nothing of friendship and loyalty. I represent the people of Gibraltar and I will fight for their right to self-determination. They value being British citizens, as I do, because Britain is a country of decency and democracy. What value a British passport if the Prime Minister can change fundamental legislation without reference to Parliament? What value a proud history 
if our future allies will be despots? What value international respect if it is squandered for narrow economic advantage? Thank you. Mr. Annemans, one minute. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, a call to the EU majority in this European Parliament. Please stop this emotional, uh, almost hysterical uh, performance which is designed to understate your superiority. We in the European Parliament shouldn't pretend that we have a veto. The only people who can decide in this whole debate are the populations of the UK and the European Union and I would say there are lots of sympathisers elsewhere in the UK for what Britain has decided to do. Everything else is purely technical negotiations and that's what we should stick to rather than all sorts of expressions of desire to commit revenge uh, or to couple free trade with free movement and so on. If there's one thing we can do it's to express our political desire to treat the United Kingdom without Rancun and to treat it as a good partner and an important friend. Mrs. James. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Well, the statements today by Europhile party political leaders were everything I had anticipated and feared. Total misrepresentation of facts and issues by the Socialists and the EPP group and misleading interpretation of history, UK economics, EU evol evolution by the Liberal Democrats all allowed to pass uncorrected. This morning has seen political theatre, histrionics and political opportunism at full throttle by the Europhiles and all because the United Kingdom has chosen to leave the European Union. Well, I suggest we get real and start adopting grown-up politics because there is a serious uh, leg of negotiations ahead of us and we do not need to see yet more project threat revenge and penalty from the likes of Mr Juncker, Mr Barnier and Mr Verhofstadt. That is not helpful and it, all it does is pander to a press which at the moment is misrepresenting both the EU position and the United Kingdom position and I don't feel that is helpful. So please can I ask everybody to calm down and be calm and get on with it. Thank you. Madam Hubner, two minutes. Uh, um, yeah, thank you very much, uh, Chair. Colleagues, the process of Brexit has formally started and it is testing political and technical capacities on both sides to get a timely and, as Michel Barnier said, successful agreement. The challenges the Union is now facing in the context of the UK withdrawal, they are well understood and also shared by the Union institutions. And the European Parliament is, it will be at the front of the process and has shown a high level of political openness and cooperation, but also unity in helping to define the Union's path for the upcoming negotiations. We cannot but welcome the constructive approach set out in the letter notifying the UK's intention to withdraw and setting out the approach to the negotiations. But the truth is that the really hard choices are yet to come. And for many citizens, transparent negotiations will be a learning process. We want to ensure legal certainty. We want to ensure stability, avoid disruption for citizens, for businesses across the Union through an orderly and phased withdrawal in line with the Union law and with a view to mitigate economic, political and emotional Mr. Annemann's damage. But this damage is already a fact of life. European institutions are united on the basic guiding principles and values as well as on ensuring the protection of Union's autonomy and its legal order. All this sets the right path for cooperative and above all principled negotiations based on good faith. For the European Parliament, the principles are clear. First and foremost, we must defend and promote the interests of the citizens of the Union whom we represent and safeguard the integrity and the coherence of the constitutional framework of the Union. These are the key building blocks for the negotiation and also the absolute boundaries on the basis of which the European Parliament will assess the outcome of the withdrawal negotiations through the consent procedure. 
And we must be clear that abandoning the membership cannot lead to a status quo ante and to unrealistic expectations. Let me say just the last sentence. I know that I am too long, but let me finish just by expressing my conviction that the consents of those who were against abandoning the membership should not remain unaddressed. Thank you. Mr. Stanishev, one minute. Madam Chair, dear President, dear colleagues, the time for regrets is over. The process of the UK leaving the European Union is underway. What we need is sober heads, good faith, but also a very clear mandate from the European institutions. This is what this House is doing today. First and foremost, we should aim to overcome the uncertainty regarding the lives of both EU citizens in the island and UK citizens in the European Union. And their lives should not be used as a bargaining chip as it was underlined many times, as well as the security cooperation, which is beneficial for both sides in this process. Second, trading freely would be in everyone's interest, but the UK cannot have a better deal outside the Union and the single market than it has currently. In any future arrangement, the UK will have to play by the same rules as everyone else. Thirdly, last but not least, we must also urgently launch debates on how the EU of 27 will adjust its budget, its policies and its institutions after UK withdrawal in order to respond to the expectations for our citizens. Thank you very much. Thank you. One minute. Mr. Jambaski. Thank you, Madam President. The people of the United Kingdom have made a sovereign decision. Any attempt to humiliate or uh, disadvantage the British people would be reprehensible. The United Kingdom is a friend and has always stood by us at difficult times. Northern Ireland, Ireland, Gibraltar are part of the Un Northern Ireland and Gibraltar are part of the United Kingdom. The negotiations and the negotiated outcome must guarantee the rights of the citizens of the United Kingdom and the European Union. Thank you, Chair. I was elected to represent the Welsh national interest and that's what I'll continue to do. The people of Wales have the democratic right <coughs> to decide on their own future. And that includes the kind of EU withdrawal that takes place and the way that it affects our nation. The devolved administrations of the UK, including Wales of course, should be involved at every stage of the negotiations. I do not accept that the interests of Wales can be ignored by the UK government, but that is exactly what is happening. Despite the publication of the White Paper, Securing Wales' Future, produced by Plaid Cymru and the Welsh Government. It's a comprehensive and constructive plan which includes our continuing participation in the single market, which is a top priority for our economy and our communities. I see Wales's potential as a successful nation. We have a lot to contribute to this process and to build in the future, and our voice must be heard. Thank you. Mr. Bay, one and a half minutes. Mes chers collègues, Dear colleagues, well, first of all, I'd like to uh, salute once again the courage of the British people who managed to vote against the uh, prophets of doom who said that Brexit would bring uh, chaos. Yes, British democracy, one of the oldest democracies in the world, has managed to overcome all of the uh, forecasts of the globalized technocrats who are... Uh, uh, dominating Brussels and even Paris. Well, there's no point in threatening the British. It's in all of our interest that this should be a soft exit with respect and calm. 
the UK is not leaving Europe, it's leaving the European Union, a supranational body that's been built without the support of its people and even against them, making our nations powerless uh, at the expense of the uh, multinationals. Well, for too long now, people have been calling for an end to bureaucracy, the attacks on democracy, the ideologies which damages our vital interests. It's particularly the case of the dogma of free circulation of goods, capital and people. Europe, our Europe, has existed for thousands of years and it's you who are destroying it. We need to rebuild it through useful cooperation between sovereign nations and that's to say giving back people their freedom, starting with the freedom to defend their identity, their culture, the tremendous heritage that we have to pass on and enrich. It's a fundamental right of the peoples to, ha uh, to have self-determination and to remain masters of their own destiny. Uh, Mr. Kelly, one and a half minutes. The talk of Brexit and divorce reminds me of the song 20 Ways to Leave Your Lover. You know the one. Slip out the back, Jack. Hop on the bus, Gus. And now we have Say Day Day May. I wish it were that simple. But this divorce after 44 years and with no precedent looks like it's going to be tough and possibly rough. For that reason, we need calm heads, clear minds and creative thinking. But with Michel Barnier at the helm, I think we have the package. Where Ireland is concerned, we're very grateful to all groups in the European Parliament for taking the concerns of our Taoiseach, our government and my colleagues on board. The special circumstances of Ireland are referenced and this sends out a powerful message to the citizens of Ireland and of Europe that when one country, no matter how small, is adversely affected, disproportionately threatened, the European Union will stand in solidarity behind them. And why are we threatened, both economically and politically? But with this solidarity, we can be confident that the terms of the Good Friday Agreement will be observed to the letter, that there won't be, can't be, and mustn't be a return to hard border, and that the prosperity of Ireland, especially our exporting sector, must not and cannot and will not be sacrificed on the high altar of expediency or pride. Common sense, not nonsense, pragmatism, not pride must prevail. This is the best way to leave your lover. Come on, good Ultron. Two minutes. Mrs. Wilmot. Thanks very much, President. Last June, I toured my constituency day in and day out, making clear my concerns about the dangers of Britain leaving the EU, dangers for our economy and British businesses and the threats to jobs they create. Dangers for British workers, as the Tory right clamour to use Brexit to spark a bonfire of EU workers' rights. Dangers for British and EU citizens, with our cooperation on issues like counter-terrorism and security linked to our EU membership. Now we lost the EU referendum, and while it saddens me to say it, Britain is leaving the EU. But those dangers are still there. In all our countries, there are families for whom the Brexit vote has created worrying uncertainty. Millions of people concerned about their rights to live and work in countries they've made home. Citizens across Europe are now at risk of the economic consequences of a bad deal, or even worse, no deal at all. And people in all 28 countries <clears throat> will suffer if Brexit means competition on low wages, lax environmental standards and scale back rights for workers and consumers. These are the people we represent and these are the people to whom this parliament must give a voice. Now it won't always be easy to take the responsible path in the coming months but it's what we must do. There are some in this house and beyond who are actively hoping to plunge Europe and Britain into chaos through a disorderly no-deal Brexit. Why? Because they have no answers to the questions that constructive negotiations will bring. So let us work for a constructive deal. 
And to those Leave campaigners who now sit in the British Cabinet or on the benches opposite, there's still one of them there I can see, you won. Now take responsibility for the promises you made. Absolutely. And as, as we all consider how we conduct ourselves over the coming weeks, let's remember that we are here representing people whose lives and livelihoods depend on the outcome. Serious times calls for a serious response. And now for one minute, Mr. Krasnodopsky. Thank you, Pani Thank you very much, Madam President. The United Kingdom, as Prime Minister Theresa May said, is leaving the Union, not Europe. That is a reminder to us that despite the current exclusive newspeak, the Union does not equal Europe. And we shouldn't forget that in the negotiations with the UK. We shouldn't forget about our shared heritage, shared interests, which we shall continue to have in common once the UK has left the Union. The negotiations must not seek to punish Britain for a democratic decision to withdraw in a manner the treaties allow. The Union cannot be a community of fear and coercion. That would be its demise. Instead, what we need now is to start reforming the Union to restore its spirit of freedom and solidarity based on freedom. Mr. Smith, one minute. President, uh, thank you. As a Scottish European, I've uh, long wondered how I'd feel today. And the answer is I'm heartbroken. Not for myself, but for the people I serve for future generations. And Scotland will not be silent within this process as our rights are taken away by an administration we did not support, by a vote that we clearly rejected, and a process that is demonstrably against our interests. I'm also, while being heartbroken, also angry. I'm angry at this process. I'm angry at the way the UK is representing itself, doing a bad thing badly. Well, colleagues, Mrs May, Nigel Farage does not speak for Scotland. Do not speak for me. Do not speak for 48% of the UK's population. The UK is not one block much as Mrs May would like it to be. The UK is a complicated set of various interests, all of which are better reflected in this resolution than in anything the UK government has put forward to date. Scotland will not be silent in this process. And Scotland's top priority, in the words of our First Minister Nicola Sturgeon, is to keep our citizens safe. Scotland is your home. You are welcome here. I appreciate that nothing is agreed till everything is agreed, but please, colleagues, let's make our citizens feel safe. Our citizens from the UK and other countries and from our nations in ours. Let's deal with that first. Let's deal with that fast. Let's deal with it now. Thank you. Thank you. No, I'm... Go uh, no, I'm not giving you the floor. I'm going to move to our next speaker, Mr. Royal, for one and a half minutes. Frau Präsident, Herr Präsident, meine lieben Kollegen. President, ladies and gentlemen, I haven't got much to add to what's been said. Brexit is very bothersome. I think it's also an enormous mistake. What we have to decide now is how we can deal with this in an effective and fair way. I think the work of the Commission and the President, Mr. Juncker and Mr. Barnier, are very good and hopefully by working through this in a step-by-step -step way we can achieve good results. On the other hand, such difficult situations always provide opportunities, opportunities for the other 27, and this is perhaps something we should talk up a bit more, an opportunity to become more reliant on each other, to trust each other a bit more, to become more reliable, and to start presenting our shared project in a more offensive way to the outside world. I think we should use this as an opportunity to try to trigger off a sense of enthusiasm in the population about the European project. It's perhaps not a chance occurrence that people are, have been out in the streets recently demonstrating for Europe. We should use this opportunity. And as I said, we have to promote reliability amongst our partners. We also have to be in a position to find ways of actually tackling people's problems. We have to provide proofs that the people, that people's concerns can be effectively solved by politicians, including us here in the European Parliament. And that hopefully will lead to a happy ending. And 
this is an opportunity for employment and prosperity in Europe. It's also perhaps an opportunity to further promote uh, innovation and economic strength. We should focus on that rather than how we can try and balance our weaknesses and strengths. If we take such a positive slant, I think even if Brexit is a massive mistake, it can be an enormous opportunity for the European Union. For one minute, Mr. Geyer. Thank you very much, Madam President. President Juncker, Minister, colleagues. Mr. Uh, Barnier, you referred to the settling of accounts and not a penalty. The UK has not bought into a company from which it's now withdrawing its capital. It invested in a political alliance and it benefited from uh, economic advantages. Perhaps the UK no longer appreciates this, but uh, the agreement signed by UK uh, Prime Ministers uh, must be uh, respected in the long run. You can't go into an English pub, have several rounds of drinks and a slap-up meal and then walk out without uh, paying the bill. The uh, uh, treaties, the budgetary commitments have been signed uh, by the United Kingdom. The United Kingdom also has its uh, share of uh, the um, uh, pension entitlements of British and other EU officials. Thank you. Mr. Nicholson, one minute. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Madam President. I, I want today not to dwell on the past. Rather, I would like to look to the future. We all need to come together with a plan that works for everyone and build a good foundation for our future relationships with the European Union. For the sake of all our people, in the United Kingdom and the European Union needs to work together to be strong allies and close friends when we leave. Europe has been a strong friend to Northern Ireland and gave us strong support during our darkest days. I am confident that friendship will continue. I welcome the fact that all sides want a frictionless border. However, we all know that finding a solution will require a lot of innovative thinking. Any solution must not diminish Northern Ireland's place as an integral part of the United Kingdom as enshrined in the principle of consent in the Belfast Agreement. And can I make it clear to you, Mr Barnier, I will not accept a hard border. Also, I will not accept an internal UK border. I would also urge EU leaders not to heed those who merely using Brexit as an excuse to break up the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. And let me make it clear also, and I hope you are listening, Mr Barnier. I hope you are listening, Mr Barnier. I want to make it very clear to you, not twiddling with your telephone as you seem to be doing, I would suggest you actually listen to the speech with the greatest respect. Can I say to you very clearly, Dublin does not speak for Belfast. We will take care of ourselves. One and a half minutes, Mr. Lewandowski. Thank you. This debate didn't have to happen. This resolution didn't have to happen. But there's a country, there's a country that I admired, that was an inspiration to me when I lived behind the Iron Curtain. But in that country, the existential question, to be or not to be in the European Union, uh, became crucial to the future of a single uh, political party. But now, Brexit is a fact. We are leaping into the unknown. Scotland has one uh, vision of the future, Northern Ireland has another, England has a third vision. We have a road map in the form of a motion for resolution. And from now on, we'll be deciding the fate of 27 EU member states. And we don't particularly need advice from our British colleagues. The uh, motion for uh, resolution very much reflects the view of my delegation.
we want an orderly uh, departure. We need a departure before we lay out the future. The UK situation cannot be better than uh, in the member states. Thank you very much. Madame Revo Delon, one minute. Well, no one has anything to gain from the UK leaving the EU. A break is always uh, painful, and if unity is strength, then disunity is a source of vulnerability. Britain has nothing to uh, gain from finding itself alone on the international stage, and it loses all the benefits it gets from the European Union. Freedom of movement, freedom to change your residence, the single market, the Charter of Fundamental Rights, etc., etc., the European Union will lose from this, it will lose a member, it will uh, uh, plunge many of its citizens into uh, an uncertain future. So all pro-Europeans have a, a huge political responsibility. Despite all of the sa sadness we might feel personally about our colleagues, comrades or f friends, we need to turn this political crisis into an opportunity for the re-foundation of Europe. We need to fight to ensure that citizens should be the first priority in the negotiations, and whatever the, uh, the partnership that may follow. But we need to use Brexit as an opportunity to profoundly reform the EU. We need a Europe of protection, prosperity and peace, a Europe that can re regain all of its true splendour. And that is the condition for the survival of the European project. Thanks. One and a half minutes, Monsieur Prost. Madame la Présidente. Madam President, we are finally having this debate since the UK has finally decided to trigger Article 50. The very least we can say is it's been a long time coming, showing a lack of preparation on the part of the British government. On behalf of the EPP, I'd like to wish Michel Barnier every success. I'm sure he has all the skills needed to do this job skillfully and with pragmatism. Today's resolution, which shows that we have a democratic institution which has to agree on red lines, will provide a useful basis for the work of the Commission of the Member States. On the other hand, communication is essential. We have to talk to our citizens. That's the role we have to play as politicians. We are elected officials representing the men and women back in our constituencies. In the very vague situation surrounding Brexit up until now, many people might say, what's the point in the UK leaving the European Union? They've already left, haven't they? And similar things could apply to many of our populists who've cut themselves off from the European Union. But let's be honest, isolation leads to decline. And the Kingdom of the United Kingdom will almost certainly be weakened by Brexit, in particular since if Scotland decides to leave the UK to stay close to the world's leading economic powerhouse, the European Union. Let's be blunt, the UK has decided to leave the single market. This will damage Britain's economic strength. Theresa May has called for a stable relationship in the future with the EU, but she will have to enter into clear financial commitments on behalf of her country. Before leaving a restaurant table, you have to pay the bill. And let's face it, divorces are always expensive. So let's stop hesitating. Our citizens are sick and tired of half-hearted promises. Let's be pragmatic in negotiations with our British friends and pragmatic and realistic when it comes to forging future relations. One minute, Mr. Dante. Senor President. President, colleagues, Jacques Delors said it's impossible to fall in love with the single market. He's probably still right, and maybe that's why the British have decided to leave. But nevertheless, the single market represents a, a success story, the big success story in the process of European integration. If Brexit has one merit, it will bring out the uh, huge benefits that the single market makes to everybody's daily lives. Our task is to preserve the values and freedoms that underlie the uh, European Union. Brexit means that the European uh, Union and its member states need to take a step forward in the move towards uh, 
extremism and protectionism. I think that uh, Europe should be uh, proud of what it stands for. What's at stake for the future is not just the future is not just the future of the Europe uh, of the Great Britain, but the future of the 27 European Union member states. That is what we uh, need to work on, and that's the way history will judge us on. Mr. Cesar, one minute. Grazie, Presidente. Thank you, Madam President. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure that most of us never wanted to take part in these debates. I think the vast majority of EU citizens never want to talk about Brexit. However, we now have to face what's happened with a decisive attitude and determination, Mr. Barnier. I think it's important that we take a long-term vision and our resolution, which is very precise and well-drafted, should support this. I would like to congratulate the President of the Parliament and the leaders of the groups who have uh, uh, signed it. These negotiations will be neither short nor simple. It's essential that Europe speaks with a single voice, a single voice of 27 member states and three institutions, which all have to pull together. We have to negotiate while bearing in mind the interests of our citizens and we should be ambitious in our requests and insistence on unity. Once again, we should use the language of unity. Brexit won't stop us. And this was written once again in the celebrations in Rome a couple of weeks ago. Clearly, our project of the European Union area of peace and prosperity will ultimately be strengthened by Brexit. This, ladies and gentlemen, is a real opportunity for us to relaunch the European Union. Thank you. Thank you. One and a half minutes. Madam Zippel. Thank you. Eine Mehrheit in Großbritannien hat a majority in the United Kingdom decided to leave the EU and that has consequences. Just under three million EU citizens live and work in the EU. They, uh, uh, they have families there, their children go to school, they work, they pay taxes and their future is uncertain. There are more than one and a half million Brits in uh, other EU member states who are currently fully-fledged EU citizens, but what will be their fate in two years' time after Brexit has taken effect? Conservative uh, David Cameron will go down in history as a man uh, for whom short-term populist victory was more important than the fate of all of these people and to UKIP. Taking back your country. You are trying to destroy this continent and you do not care how much your citizens and our citizens will suffer from it. But listen carefully. We will not let you succeed. We will continue to fight for a Europe based on solidarity and justice, a Europe where facts expose the lies, a Europe that protects its citizens and does not leave them with the prospect of an uncertain and glooming future. And I hope one day UK will become a real full member of this European Union. Thank you. Madam Valian, one minute. Thank you very much, Madam Vice President. While I'll join my voice with those who express their regrets to see the United Kingdom leaving the EU, I, however, respect the will of the British people. I still believe they were wrong. It is a difficult moment, as never have faced such a complex challenge to undo the deep ties that we have founded in our common history. However, let's be pragmatic, as British people like to be. As chairwoman of the Environment Committee, I want to send a strong message both to the EU and the UK. We are bent to work together constructively in the best interest of our citizens to ensure a clean and safe environment, a high level of public health and food security, and pursue our common commitments to the climate change. We will need to ensure a rapid transfer of our European Medicine Agency as soon as practical, as is said in the resolution, because we have to make sure to avoid uncertainty regarding its future and limit the loss of skilled staff and their vital expertise. So I would say we have to cooperate together in good spirit. It makes no sense in believing that environmental and health issues stop at the borders. So I wish, you, uh, I wish us all the best of uh, 
future. Thank you. Thank you. For one minute, Mr. Weidenholzer. Brexit is something we'll be dealing with for quite a long time. Like many of my colleagues, we think this was a bad decision. It was badly prepared, badly thought out, and short-sighted. Like many, uh, I regret what's happened. Our British friends are going to be leaving us, and it's going to be a difficult time for the United Kingdom. But we have to remember that history cannot be stopped. You have to think about the collateral damage. We can't allow the, those who weren't to blame to pay for it. I'm particularly thinking of those three million EU citizens who currently live in the UK. Their decision to move to the UK was made on the basis of very different preconditions. They have contributed to the prosperity of, of the United Kingdom. They and their children now have to uh, deal with an unbearable level of uncertainty. Their fate has to be beyond dispute and negotiation. We need clear answers from our British friends. But it should not be difficult because fairness and pragmatism are characteristics that we have always uh, appreciated in the British. Thank you. Mr. Shufflin, one minute. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, we can be certain that this resolution will not be popular in Brexit circles. There will definitely be those who will denounce it as impertinent or worse. There are many in the United Kingdom who see leaving the European Union as a kind of liberation. It can take uh, quite a while for illusions to dissipate. For the time being, the launching of Article 50 has brought with it an early silly season. Bizarre things are being said and no doubt will continue to be said. Now, this can be irritating, even provocative, but that's no reason for us to follow suit. On the contrary, we can stay calm and pursue negotiations with the same professionalism and commitment that is reflected in this resolution. After all, the UK will always have a relationship with Europe. Our aim is and should be to frame the long term to ensure that the future is a positive sum game. Madam Toma, one minute. Oui, merci, Madame la Thank you, Madam President. Minister. President of the Commission, regret and disappointment still seem to be the dominant feelings uh, amongst a large number of people facing decision taken by the British people. What we need now are negotiations based on a consistent and constructive strategy. At the same time, however, we must also fight hard for the interests of other Europeans. The European Union has, I think, been offered the opportunity of renaissance, a new birth by Brexit. The British seem to be refusing to be members of the single market because they refuse the freedoms which go with it. And we should prevent other people being tempted to try to get back into the market through the window rather than through the front door. Whatever name Miss May wants to give the agreement she's trying to get, we shouldn't accept it if it questions environmental and social values or to allow them to cherry pick when it comes to legislative uh, rules. We should also prevent them conducting in social dumping or tax dumping. We should be inflexible when it comes to budgetary rules. We have to protect the EU budget, which is enormous, already under enormous pressure, uh, including because of the devaluation of the sterling. Of sterling. And Cheryl, one minute. <laughs> Thank you, President. Uh, President Juncker, Monsieur Barnier, President Bark, I'd like to uh, put our position, uh, to show it, with three quotes of Shakespeare, a great British and European writer. First, our position, our attitude at pro committed pro-Europeans is very well described in Hamlet when Horatio describes the expression of the father of Hamlet, a countenance more in sorrow than in anger. That will be our attitude in our negotiation. Then, I'd like to give a piece of advice to our British colleagues with another quote, because you should be very aware of your bard Shakespeare, what he has said. We know what we are, 
but know not what we may be. And finally, I'd like to answer to Mr. Farage with a quote from Shakespeare that probably is a fake quote, what is uh, very, very appropriate to someone that is a post-truth politician. Love me or hate me, both are in my favor. If you love me, I'll always be in your heart. If you hate me, I always be in your mind. Mr. Martin, one minute. <laughs> Thank you, President. In September 2014, I voted to keep Scotland in the United Kingdom Union. In June 2016, I voted to keep the UK in the European Union. Today, I face the reality that Brexit will remove my country from one union and leaves the other union hanging by a thread. Scotland voted overwhelmingly to remain in the European Union. Edinburgh, a city I have represented in this House for 33 years, voted 75-25 to remain in the European Union. The overwhelming feeling in Scotland is that we are being dragged out of the European Union against our will, a feeling only compounded by Mrs May's determination to pursue a hard Brexit for which she has no mandate. The resolution we are about to vote on recognises this fact but provides no solution. The Council document calls for a flexible and imaginative solution to be found for Ireland. I of course agree, but I think the same should also apply to Scotland. The Scottish Government has put forward a bespoke proposal for Scotland which I think deserves serious attention in this House. In conclusion, President, I want to say that if the UK does not show flexibility in these talks, it will not only be the UK leaving the European Union, but the UK will not exist any longer. One minute, Mrs. Gabriel. Благодаря, госпожо председател, господин президент, господин Барнес, скъпи колеги. Thank you, Madam President. We ha have established the guidelines for the negotiations and the foundations for new cooperation. And uh, in this regard, Mr. Barnier, we're on the right track. I think the citizens must be the top priority. It is our duty to assuage their fears and to provide clear and specific answers to a series of issues. For instance, the situation of uh, European citizens who are in the UK and the Erasmus. Our top priority from the outset must be to guarantee the rights. The European Union must be firm on the four freedoms. Uh, Europe a la carte is simply not a possible s scenario. And that's something the, the uh, UK cannot aspire to. And we need a clear vision. First of all, exit, uh, agreement to that, and then a future partnership. And we must ha have a clear foundation, set of foundations. You begin building a house from the bottom, not from the roof. No parallel negotiations, therefore, and also full involvement of the European Parliament so we can have an open debate. Thank you. One minute. Thank you, President. Colleagues, I don't agree with those who say that it won't change anything with Brexit, also because we don't know what the consequences are going to be. I do, however, agree with those people who say that the negotiations should be constructive and what should be key is the interest of the citizens, the European citizens and also UK citizens. No revenge. However, clear rules should prevail. We need to repeat what the rules are for the EU. Of course, respect to the four freedoms and in the power of the EU for the developing international trade. Now, of course, no one is thinking of tearing down the European edifice, but also no one should be playing to divide or weaken the UK. The negotiations should have a political vision. We have to ensure that ultimately our friendship, our relations and our cooperation should all be strengthened. We need to work together for this and today's resolution is a good 
starting point for the way ahead. Mr. Niedermeyer, one minute. Thank you, Madam. Uh, I believe in Europe of today. I believe in our European project, project that is based on belief that together we are stronger and we do things better. That's why it makes me sad if you, Mr. Farage, and your friends are calling this project to be prison. And let me remind you that 48% of voters in the referendum didn't share this view, and many millions didn't actually participate. Also, I have heard Mr. Fox, if I'm not mistaken, saying that he's calling for, for close and uh, deep partnership and for invisible borders. If this is what you are calling for, then welcome back in Europe. Welcome back in the European Union, because this is what we are aiming for. Instead of that, in practice, you are calling for negotiation, negotiation of similar, similar agreement like we have with US, Korea or Canada. If this is so, please don't be surprised that in this negotiation we will represent interests of 27 countries, like we did in negotiation with, uh, with Canada, US or Korea. It shouldn't be no surprise for you. Thank you very much. One minute, Mr. Liberadzki. Thank you very much, Madam President, dear President Juncker, dear Michel Barnier. This resolution is a good document. It's as simple as that. I support it, especially those points stipulating that as soon as possible we should start the negotiation under Article 50. We are going to negotiate in good faith. And finally, we are going to negotiate as a bloc of 27 member states. We are going to defend the interests of EU citizens. I'm a Polish MEP and I have a vital interest in defending the interests of half a million Poles living in the UK. Their future is uncertain. The UK cannot expect one-sided benefits to the detriment of other EU citizens. I am well aware of the fact that the 27 member states will be a smaller union, but we do not need to be weaker. My heart is with my friends from the Labour Party who were expressing their sadness because of what has happened. Thank you. One minute, Mr. Karas. President, ladies and gentlemen, we are doing the citizens of the UK a disservice. For years before the referendum and also now, they've been misled. The EU has been blamed instead of accepting co-responsibility. The member states' uh, value is uh, being ignored. Independence was promised. However, division is being risked, a new dependence is being risked. Promises were made to get the money back and the consequences were not mentioned. There is no participation in the single market without acceptance of the four freedoms, without sticking to the fundamental rights, without participating in the costs and without accepting the European Court of Justice. Rights and values and commitments that have been undertaken over the last 40 years. That's the basis for negotiations. Nothing more, nothing less. And let's learn from that. Mr. Silva Pereira, one minute. Thank you, Madam President. Many expected Brexit to be the beginning of the end of the European project. But there is broad political consensus uh, cross-party consensus behind today's resolution on the uh, Brexit negotiations and that in and of itself is a hugely important signal of unity and also grounds for great hope. The European Parliament has defined clear priorities uh, and one in particular and that is guaranteeing the respect for the rights of European citizens in the UK and the rights of uh, UK citizens living in the EU. And this is something that is not subject to, to trading and of course in the UK EU citizens are, have to fill an 85 page uh, form to be authorised to stay in the UK 
freedom of circulation currently still binds the UK and will do so until the day it leaves the EU and, and uh, if there's a transitional re regime conceivably beyond that this European Parliament will not give ground on protecting the rights of European citizens in the UK. Mrs. De Lange, one minute. Madam President, in a couple of weeks I will take my six-year-old son to London for the first time and he will see the cenotaph and I will tell him about the bravery of those men who fought in two European wars and to whom we will be eternally grateful. But he will not understand, because thank God he has never known war. Although not too far away from here, and you can laugh, but not too far away from here, children his age and younger are dying in the poisonous clouds of Idlib, the same clouds that we saw over Flanders fields a century ago. And it's for those generations of young Europeans, those born after the fall of the Berlin Wall, that the remaining 27 member states need to stand united and together and work at a reformed and stronger European Union. And it is for those young generations of Brits that we need a fair deal and a continued relationship with the United Kingdom because they did not vote to leave. And let us, dear colleagues, Politicians of this very old continent show the young people in Britain and in Europe alike that Europe is not a place of hate, of pitiness or of revenge, but we can learn the lessons of the past and reshape a future in which the negotiating table will always, always prevail over outright conflict. Thank you very much. Mr. Koffer, one minute. President, uh, Brexit will be the most difficult, costly, unnecessary divorce in history. In the coming months and years, the EU 27 and the UK government will end up in any number of cat's fights we can expect. But let me be crystal clear. Whatever the cost, whatever the hassle, whatever the differences of opinions, this Parliament will serve the citizens of Europe, period. We are their directly elected voice. We will be their strongest defender, their best advocate in this, and its uh, ally. This goes for EU citizens and for UK citizens. We will not allow the Brexiters, broken promises, half-truths and even lies to harm the citizens of the UK and EU any more than they already have done. To the citizens of the 27 remaining member states, I say, we will never allow a post-Brexit UK to undermine your rights and conditions by competing in a race to the bottom. And to the citizens of the UK, I say, we will continue to fight for your best interest and we will keep a seat for you at our table. Thank you so much. Mrs. Redding, one minute. Madame le Président. President, well, of course, a successful divorce is better than a poor marriage. And for this to be the case for Brexit, there are several conditions that we have to fulfill. First of all, priority to the conditions of separation, well, custody of children, sharing the goods, rights to visit, of course, with reciprocity and rapidity. The European Parliament did understand this by asking for guarantees for the citizens for the debts and for the external borders. Secondly, Th there will then be a transition period so that everyone can adapt to the new life on the condition that there is payment of the alimony under the control of the judges and there too the message is clear. No rights without obligations, no access to the internal market without respect of the four freedoms. Now once the divorce has been handed down and not before, we need maturity in order to maintain civilized relations even if never nothing will be as it was before. So that's why we don't want any dumping, transforming the UK into a transit company, nor blackmail concerning free movement or the security of the citizens as a trade-off for security. So divorce is a new departure. Brexit will be a renewal of Europe with the treaties as our guide. One minute, Mr. Manika. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. The figures provided by the UK Treasury indicate that uh, the UK is going to lose more than 122 billion euros over the following next five years. The most recent analyses show that Brexit is going to result in a loss of a half million jobs in the coming years. Barclays Bank has confirmed that the relocation of activities in banking sector outside of Britain is inevitable. These are not optimistic prospects, indeed. I have the following message for UK. We suffer too, just like those of you who voted to remain, but we still respect the will expressed by the majority. We are starting to define together the shape of our future. These uncertain times may last more than two years. If you should find in the course of this period that life outside of EU is going to seriously damage your future, do not hesitate to come back. Wise politicians do not let uh, harm fall upon their own citizens. Thank you. Alza, one minute. That's it. Thank you very much, Madam Chairman. The United Kingdom is an important partner for the European Union and for Malta. The United Kingdom is going to remain an important partner, but it is disappointing for us that the United Kingdom chose to no longer remain an EU member. However, we must bear in mind that there are going to be strong ties remaining even after the UK leaves the EU. This is why we cannot enter into negotiations in a confrontational manner. We must endeavour uh, to see which are the best conditions between the EU and the third country with which we enjoy good relations. But uh, the United Kingdom obviously must make certain sacrifices, cannot expect privileges without accompanying uh, responsibilities. Therefore, we must uh, base ourselves on certain principles. The uh, time has passed to make choices which are only of our own benefit. Now it is crucial that uh, a million of uh, European and British citizens on both sides would have our protection as well as to their rights. I am convinced that we can reach a compromise needed. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Bostonaro, one minute. Thank you very much. Mr. President, by nationality, Romanian, and by profession, historian, I am fascinated by your great leader, Winston Churchill. But today I have to confess, I don't know what he would say about Brexit or he will, how he would judge the Brexiters. This is a, a real question mark. When it comes to the status of the European citizens in the UK, the negotiations must be based on the principles of reciprocity and full equality among the EU citizens. This means that we need to make sure that our citizens who currently live and work in the UK can continue to freely do so without any discrimination against them or between them based on their nationality. Under such circumstances, we can accept as EU to grant the same status to the UK citizens in our member states. Equally important is the issue of security, defence and counter-terrorism, where EU and UK are mutually fundamental, as we are reminded by the recent terrorist attack in London. Both EU and UK, we need to be wise and pragmatic. This is too important an issue to leave the security gap for those who threaten our common values and our challenges, equally the security of our citizens. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, shame on all of the youths who are speaking of uh, the UK in bad terms. They're talking about punishments, about bills. The real political greatness is uh, revealed in recognizing the people's decision that the people of Britain decided to leave the UK. And you've there are two ways of uh, reacting. The Schultz-Juncker model, more centralization, 
taking away more powers from uh, peoples and the states, or you can do the other way. You can let the member states get on with it and decide things for themselves. You can let the, the parliaments uh, of the member states take decisions. You like, allow direct democracy uh, in the member states, allow that to take president of the European Union. I think we should to try to reach out to the UK with friendship. We need sensible cooperation. And, you know, stop using these uh, childish comparisons of a divorce. Uh, act like grown-ups uh, in a level-headed way, in a professional way, so that both sets of interests can be served. Arriva la fase We're now moving into the closing phase of the debate. Turning to the group leaders, Mr. Farage. Thank you. Well, I keep hearing what a positive project the European Union is. Well, Article 8 of your beloved treaty says the Union shall develop a special relationship with neighbouring countries in a spirit of good neighbourliness. Well, I get that. I understand that. I'm with that. That makes a lot of sense. So why, why, if that's the case, would Mr. Tusk have written Article or Clause 22 into his memorandum giving the Spanish a veto over the future of Gibraltar when everyone knows that the Spanish are antagonistic towards the wishes of the people of the Rock. And why, Monsieur Barnier, why, in a spirit of good neighbourliness, would you have plucked this bizarre figure of 52 billion sterling out of the air that you say is our final settlement payment? Remember one thing, from the moment we voted Brexit, to the moment we leave, we will net have put £30 billion into this European Union and you want another 50. It just doesn't work. For any negotiation in life to work, both sides stake out a position. Both sides ask for more than they realistically expect to get. I understand that. But you've gone so far with this that it's just impossible for us to see any accommodation. I think there needs to be give and take on both sides. And I think if you gave on the money and you gave on Gibraltar, then what I would like to see the United Kingdom government doing is saying there are 3.3 million EU citizens living in the UK. They all came to Britain legally and we will now unilaterally guarantee their rights for the future. Both sides need to give on this for any sensible deal to come out of it. We can walk away without a deal. It will hurt European workers and European companies more than us. But surely it makes sense for both of us to come to a sensible accommodation. Honorable Lambert. Mr. Lambert. Mr. President, if we want to get to a sensible accommodation, uh, Mr. Farrar's speech is precisely the kind of nonsense that we should just ignore. I just want to say that Brexit is a lose-lose game. I would have much preferred for us to stay together, l'union fait la force, we say in Belgium, and that remains the case today. But there's one thing, there's one thing where I believe no compromise is possible. And that's the only thing that really annoyed me in Mrs. May's letter. It's about security cooperation. Security cooperation is an area where we cannot let a lose-lose logic prevail. It is in the interest of the safety and security of all our citizens, British or otherwise, to cooperate deeply in matters of security. And what we cannot accept is that any other kind of consideration, trade, commercial, whatever, stands in the way. There is no trade-off here. It goes about the lives of men and women. Thank you very much. Honorable Zim. Mrs. Zima. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, the European Parliament, as we've seen today, has a high degree of responsibility for accompanying the process of negotiations. I noted it with great interest that we've been told that not only today and at the end of the negotiations we'll have discussions, but I accept Mr. Barnier's and the Commission's proposal that we should also be able to express our view in the interim period. In other words, we can have a political influence on the negotiations. I think that's very important because the most important thing, and these are the criteria that my group insists on, 
we need to insist on the rights of the people who are directly affected by Brexit and that they should be maintained. We will ensure that the safety of people in Northern Ireland are respected in the, as a result of uh, the negotiation process. People shouldn't be paying the price of Brexit. It wasn't uh, because of them. There were other reasons. So they shouldn't have to pay the costs. And we are going to stick to that. Let's uh, work together and make sure that we as a parliament can really have an influence. Thank you. Mr. Verhofstadt. Short, Mr. President. I find it fantastic that Mr. Farage is using Article 217 of the Treaty on the Association Agreement. Now he is leaving, he starts to read the treaty <laughs> and to find it so good, uh, the treaty. It's uh, fantastic to, uh, to, to, uh, to see this uh, enormous positive development, <laughs> as I may say. Um, that said, I think what is clear in this debate is let's put the citizens first. And it doesn't make any difference when it are EU citizens or UK citizens. We will be firm, we need to be firm, to defend the unity and the interest of the European towards the UK authorities. But my uh, appeal here in the House today is to be open, positive, generous towards the UK citizens, because many of them, millions of them, want to keep their relationship, their link, their identity on the European uh, level. And last but not least, uh, President, my appeal also to the House is when we vote within a few minutes, we have a huge majority and almost unity in this House. It's key to do that, to have a united European Parliament together with the EU negotiator and with the European Council, and I hope for a strong vote within a few moments. Mrs. Zile. Uh, colleagues, um, divorce, sadness, bill of electricity and heating, foolishness, disruption of transport links, etc. We will only speak about the future relationships when we settle on accounts. We are the champions, but those are the other sides are the losers. We will not leave them any single cherry of the cake. That was a sum of statements which was here also today in the chamber and also in the media. I would like to ask colleagues to calm down. Does anybody believe that in the negotiations there will be winners when it comes to citizens' rights issues? Indeed, how successful can we be recall arrangement where part of the success is achieved by discriminating against the citizens of the other EU nation? Or take business that are the backbone of economies. Do we really want to extend uncertainties for next five years or even more years? It is possible with the next two years to settle the past uh, accounts and work on the comprehensive framework for the future relationships. This treaty allows and the business wait for that and at the end European people want it. So good luck for you on negotiations. La parola. Now, Mr. Pitella. President. President, not all Brits hate the EU as our colleague Mr. Farage does. I'd like to remind you that 48% of British citizens voted to stay in the EU. And I'd like to remind you with a great affection our Comrade Joe Cox, who was assassinated during the referendum campaign. No one has ever obliged the UK to do whatever that may be. I've heard terrible things. I've heard threats, uh, punishment, mafia. You decided to join the EU freely, and now freely you're deciding to leave the EU. It's not a revenge, but you cannot impose your chaos on us. No parallel negotiations. Whilst you're part of the EU, you cannot negotiate with the WTO. Now, after Brexit, we are responding with unity, as uh, invoked by Barnier and uh, Juncker, and with the calm strength of our institution. Ahora la parola. And I'll give the floor to Mr. Weber. Colleagues, today's debate 
had a good tone, and I hope that, that a lot of citizens will have followed this because they would have seen that the big parties, the European parties, have a constructive and level-headed tone. And regrettably, the populists and extremists we have here is just uh, talked it up, uh, talked about fighting on the, uh, the streets, they've got to fight for independence, uh, tough and unpleasant words. And I hope that citizens have heard this in the course of the discussion. I haven't heard any answers to the questions. What about the UK being in Europol, the research union, the uh, internal market? And Mr. Farage doesn't have any answers. Is he interested in these partnerships? Are they a worthwhile idea? So the, the main issues are still on the table, really. And there's one issue I, I have to raise here at the end. Colleagues, if we look to council, heads of state and government will discuss Brexit. And Theresa May won't be present. It's something that the EU27 will negotiate. Mrs. May shows respect to the other 27 member states. But, but uh, look at the situation. Uh, uh, in parliamentary terms, there's Westminster, uh, where British interests will be represented, they'll vote, and uh, here we have the European Parliament, where the interests of the 27 are represented. So I'm rather interested to see how Nigel Farage sees uh, the next two years panning out for him. I want to re respect uh, the fact uh, that uh, Mr. Uh, Kamal didn't speak today. He gave the floor to non-Brits to express the position of uh, his group. Uh, uh, and I hope that Mr. Farage shows the same sense of respect and honor and perhaps allows his Italian colleagues to speak on behalf of his group. M Nigel Farage has, has told us in uh, recent years how great it is that the UK is leaving the EU. So perhaps you could lead by example and uh, no longer bother us in the debates in the European Parliament. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Weber. That brings to an end. That brings to an end the first debate on the request of the United Kingdom to withdraw from the EU. I'd like to thank all those who took part in the debate, the President of the European Commission, the Chief EU Negotiator, the representatives from the Council, and all the members who took the floor during the debate. The Parliament will play a key role during these negotiations. It will have a vote at the end either in favour or against, respecting the rules of democracy. In this chamber, there are 751 members of Parliament representing 500 million European citizens, all properly elected. There are no mafia nor gangsters here. There are representatives of the people. This is nothing to do with national sensitivity. It's to do with being civil and democratic. Let's now move on to the votes on the negotiations. Vicky Ford has asked for the floor. Oh, please. I'd like to raise a point of order under Article 11.2 about this morning's debate. Calling other colleagues members of the Mafia or gangsters does not show mutual respect. It does not represent the views of the vast majority of the British people and it is not the view of the British Prime Minister who wants to remain friends, allies and partners. Thank you.
Grazie. Thank you, Mrs. Ford. And now, Mr. Uh, Unnews, also the floor. Mr. President, there's been a lot of confusion in this House this morning talking about British aggression over Gibraltar. Can I not just remind colleagues across the Parliament that actually it was Spain that sent one of their warships into Gibraltar? Please. 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 That does not seem to be a valid point of order. Let's now move on to the votes. On the draft motion for a resolution from the EPP, the Socialists, ALDE, ECR and the Greens.